there was a place you could call paradise. It's here. Set in Southeast Asia at the convergence of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, it's called the Coral Triangle. And it's the Eden of Oceans. The gene pool of much of the world's tropical marine life. Yet we know very little about it. The Coral Triangle is born of tectonic range. From the peak of the volcano to the bottom of the sea, it's a dynamic crucible of geoevolution. Already, scientists have recorded three quarters of the world's known coral species and well over 2,000 different reef fish here. The nations of the Coral Triangle contain over 360 million people living on many thousands of islands, most of whom depend on the sea for their survival. But how did the Coral Triangle come to be? We are sailing into the heart of this newly identified wonder of the natural world. To explore the most diverse marine environment on Earth. And to discover why it holds the key to the future of much of the world's ocean life. the Earth's tectonic range that forged the foundations of the Coral Triangle. But according to world whale expert Dr Benjamin Kahn, volcanoes do much more than that. He believes that whales may use the sound of the volcanoes to navigate the narrow passages of the Coral Triangle. It makes a big rumble every 15 to 20 minutes. So these blue whales and other sperm whales and other whales that we have in the area, they'll home in on an isolated oceanic island like this, like Comba. So it's like an underwater lighthouse. It's a beacon along the migration path. Here in the Coral Triangle, many of the world's species of marine mammals converge on this undersea interchange that connects the Pacific and Indian Oceans. But what brings these ocean wanderers to these narrow island passages, swimming perilously close to the shore and against the strong currents? The answer to this is another clue to the richness of life in the Coral Triangle. It's the Indonesian through-flow current. The transfer of seawater here is 10 times greater than all the rivers on Earth and carries nutrients that feed all the life in the Coral Triangle. Our expedition has joined the movable feast to follow the great ocean mammals as they navigate the narrow straits between the Banda and Savu Seas. Also on the Seven Seas is pioneer undersea explorer Valerie Taylor and her nephews, ship's captain Mark Hayes and underwater cameraman John o Hayes. You know, Mark, back in the 70s, there were a lot of whales and a lot of sharks all through this area. Valerie is most interested in sharks, which have almost disappeared due to fishing since she first came here 40 years ago. We'll get Lawrence to do that. Yes, Lawrence will be good at that. He can go in and make contact with him. Anthropologist Lawrence Blair is focusing on how 100 million coastal dwelling people and traditional fishermen who depend directly on the Coral Triangle for their livelihoods are surviving in the middle of the world's fastest growing economic region. As an anthropologist, I realised here was a nation of ancient memories and many different tribal linguistic groups and fascinating animals. 
And uh, that set me on this long course of exploring amongst these people. Our voyage into this part of the Coral Triangle takes us through the exotic islands of East Indonesia, where the through-flow of currents and the cool upwellings combine to feed this Amazon of the oceans. Benjamin Kahn is here to investigate why the Coral Triangle is such a mecca to whales. Particularly the giant blue whale, a krill eater, and the sperm whale, which is a toothed variety and dives deep to feed on squid. I'm very interested in this part of East Indonesia because there is a big migration corridor here that we are moving through right now. And it's part of a series of migration passages that we've been studying. In addition to blue whales, we can expect sperm whales moving through here and a variety of oceanic dolphins. So for me, it's really interesting to be out here and see how it can be managed in a more protective manner. There's 18,000 islands here. So you gotta find out, you know, where do you find these animals? They're rare, they're endangered. There's, there's not that many of them swimming around, and even though blue whale is 30 meters, it can be very, very hard to find. There's 1,250 blue whales in the whole southern hemisphere. So that is a very small number. And that comes down from about 400,000 blue whales that were once swimming there. They were hunted relentlessly. A boom in whales. Competition makes the hunt for the great leviathans keener than ever and modern methods have eliminated chance and risk. And it's all over, bar the profitable business of turning the carcass into money. So certain nowadays are the whalers of their prey that the giant sea mammals are growing scarce in the usual whaling waters. If they're not careful, there won't be any whales left soon. We know a couple of things about the blue whales that we see in Indonesia. We know the start of their migration. It's in the sub-Antarctic or even the Antarctic waters, way down south. And then they'll move up the Australian coast. First up is Perth and the Perth Canyon. And these whales will stop there and forage. It's a very productive area. We know that they feed there from our Australian colleagues that have done a lot of work down in Perth. And then they scoot up the West Australian coast. And they'll pretty much do that in one straight swim through. And then they'll come into the Savu Sea. And the next phase is going through the passages near Alor or Wetar. And then they've entered the Banda Sea. So there's really a big question mark about the Banda Sea and what it means for blue whales. The other great whale we get in Indonesian waters are sperm whales. The males are very rare, but when we do see them, we drop everything on the boat and we go after them. No one has really ever been here. Nobody's really had a good look around. So it's exciting to survey this part of Indonesia. So when we're talking about a dynamic oceanographic region, this is what we're talking about. It's a low ring tide. On top of that, the Indonesian flow through, which comes from the Pacific and empties out close by in the Indian Ocean, adds another two knots or so. So there'll be seven or eight knots of current right here. It hits the shore, it becomes like a waterfall at sea, and it really rips through this interlocking inter-island passage. It's ripping through, man. That's really, really amazing. Screaming. The complex coastlines, the deep channels, and the strong tidal currents create massive turbulence. The current sweeps through like an undersea cyclone, spreading rich nutrients among more than 2,000 species of reef fish, five times more than elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific. But it's not just the reef creatures that feed off the nutrients of this ocean interchange.
Ben is a world authority on sperm whales and has been studying their migration through this area. He knows their language and uses a hydrophone to listen in on their conversations as they dive for squid down to a thousand meters below. You're listening to the open ocean, it's well beyond the horizon. So I'll go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, not only horizontally, but also down. It's a three-dimensional environment, so I'm listening to a, a vast column of ocean, 16 nautical miles across, and maybe 3,000 meters deep. And then everything that's vocalizing, I, I want to be able to pick it up. Oh, this is really good. We have a group of, of sperm whales towards Timor. Not quite that far, but that's the general direction. So I can hear them echolocating, clicking away underwater. So those are all the diving whales hunting for squid. A single sperm whale would make sort of a rhythmic echolocation sound two clicks a second. But then if you get 12 or 20 down below, it becomes more like a horse race. And that's what I'm hearing now. So when I'm twisting the directional hydrophone from side to side, I can get a bearing. I can find out the direction of where these whales are. And now we're switching from survey mode into trekking mode. So that way is where we're going. So we should really keep a good lookout now because they're diving, but when they come up, they'll only come up for about 10 minutes and then they'll go down for another 45 minutes, hunting for squid, come back up, 10 minute rest, bit of a breather, and down they go again. There's a male making a mating call sound. So that's a very particular vocalization. Ping. the mail. It's like having an empty oil barrel and hitting it with a hammer. Ding! Ding! And they'll do that about once every five seconds. So I got that right underneath the boat. But then a little bit further out, there are the, the clicking females. There he is again. So they're the clicking females, and there's a foraging clicks. When they come up, the females will know that on the surface there'll be a breeding bull in the vicinity. It's not a fully grown male, but it's about 14, perhaps 15 meters, which is a sexually and socially mature bull. And it confirms that Indonesian waters, and especially the Savu Sea, are part of a calving and breeding area. He's not coming here to forage and go after squid. He's after a good time in the tropics. The foraging females come to the surface with their calves and juveniles. The male has a roving strategy. So the male will come to the tropics, seek out groups of females, these nursery pods, check out the females, stay with them for hours, possibly days, and then move on again. and there are vocalizations that are called codas. Now, codas is almost like a Morse code, and it's a digital language if you think about it. It's ones and zeros, it's on and off. It's a very precise language. Those are social vocalizations as opposed to foraging and echolocation. So these animals have a very sophisticated social organization. They stay in their particular matrilineal group for life. So there'd be aunties and youngsters, of both sexes and then the males split off in their teenage years. But the females stay together. The older animals here would be females and they have two sub-adults 
in the care, this particular female, that's actually the closest. So she's shielding them a little bit. She's just a little bit protective. She's shielding them and staying between us and the youngster. So we're seeing the whole sperm whale family at the moment. These bulls, because they're so much bigger than the females, they were hunted selectively. So there's a big change in the sex ratio. There's hardly any of those big bulls left, especially not by the end of the 80s. Slowly but surely, these big bulls are growing up and making a comeback. So yeah, for sure, it's exciting. For hundreds of years, sperm whales were hunted for their oils. And these passages of the Coral Triangle were a favorite hunting ground. Those early whalers came through this area on a global voyage. The historical knowledge of the whales goes back a long time, centuries. So we know from the Portuguese that there were whales here. And we know from the Portuguese also that there were whale hunters here, traditional whale hunters. And then the Yankee whalers came through. We know that there was a particular male sperm whale called Timor Tom, who created quite a bit of havoc around Timor Island. From the logbooks of those early whalers, we know that there were sperm whales out here in abundance. That was their target species. They were after the oil in the spermaceti organ of the sperm whales. Ben has found a giant bull sperm whale, mature and much bigger than the one he found before. The big male just surfaced. He's traveling in the same direction as the mother and the juvenile, yes. He's about twice the size. So that is a phenomenal encounter, because these animals, they can dive to about 3,000 meters deep. They have a, a jaw that can bite a man in half, but this is a very big, powerful apex predator. And it's not in Indonesia to hunt, it's in Indonesia to mate. Sperm whales circulating between the northern and southern hemispheres come together in the narrow island passages of the Coral Triangle to feast and mate. This bull is a rare survivor from the whaling boom of the 1970s, when the males were specially targeted. The males are very big, almost twice the size as the females, and they weigh about three times. So a male is about 18 meters maximum and 45 tons. So we have to be, take extra care, of course, with such a big, powerful animal, not to upset it in any way. It's just spectacular to see such a big apex predator of the deep, so close to a speedboat, which in comparison looks more like a toothpick. And then when the tail comes up, you realize how powerful this animal actually are. One little whack with this tail and with these flying all over the place out of our little speedboat. <laughs> this wheel is really trying to get a connection with these females that are also around here. And he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's on a mission. But the prospect of swimming with him is tempered by the memory of a bad experience. And I was x-rayed by a sperm whale doing a frontal drop with sperm whales going up the front in order to get more information on the water. And it's starting to blast me with its echolocation sound. But it is very intense. It's like somebody really hitting on your chest very hard. It's hurtful. The animal opened up its jaw, and I could count the teeth. And at that stage, I was doing a big back paddle. I have this living submarine that is pinging you intensely. And that lasted for about 30 or 40 seconds. And then it swam off. But that certainly left a, a very vivid memory. As you get closer and closer to this big, massive sperm whale bull, you see it appear out of the blue. It's just such a big animal. What we see on the surface is just a glimpse. It's like an iceberg with 90% of it underwater. It is massive. Maybe a good 40 tons. 
and then you get closer still and you can see the contour and then the wrinkles on the skin and then the fluke the tail which is about three and a half meters across and then you're finning and finning and finning and finning and suddenly it strikes you you're not really getting any closer but it doesn't seem to be doing anything it's just gliding effortless through the water with all its bulk and then the animal just goes with one little fluke up and down very relaxed and it just takes off right away and not only does it takes off I'm getting the washout, so whatever comes off that fluke, big volumes of water as it propels itself and pushes itself through the water, I'm getting all of that going, I'm like, wow, and then it's all over. There's no way you can catch up again. Underwater, they just are so much bigger than just from the surface. I mean, just the girth and the volume of it. And not only does it take off, but you're getting this washout. It's like, you know, you're completely set back. Amazing power without any effort whatsoever. In a modern world where whaling is almost taboo, there's one place where sperm whales are still hunted and it's here in the heart of the Coral Triangle. The people in the village of Lamalera take six or more whales a year for food and spiritual sustenance. It seems a curious place for a whale conservationist like Ben, who's been coming here for more than 10 years. This is part of the Savu Sea Whale Program. So we're coming into this village to look at their traditional way of life, because it is a special village in that respect, how to hunt sperm whales in particular. And secondly, I'm assessing it on, on modern influences and, and the degree of modernization. I was lucky enough to come here in the sort of late 70s for the first time, and it was an incredibly wild and woolly place. They would sacrifice the brains of manta rays on the prows of their little hunting vessels. They had human skulls of their ancestors in the back over here. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi, Bapak Gibila. Terima kasih. This is the harpoon head that goes into these long bamboo harpoons. It sticks in here with that coil attached. And when the thing takes off and there's a whale in the neighborhood and, it's a, and it is harpoon, there'll be ropes shooting left, right and center. You have to be very, very careful where you stand, or otherwise these coiled ropes might well take you over the side. This would be part of their traditional religion. Those would be going back hundreds of years, those symbols. And of course it is found right next to San Peter, Saint Peter. So they are caught between two stools at this very moment in history. Here's some of the skulls from previous hunts. They saved the bones and they actually do the hunt in an ancestral belief that these sperm whales are their forefathers and they'll have to go out, catch them to bring them back, bring them home, so to speak. And that includes scattering the bones around the village. So, in essence, they are trying to reunite. They're worried about this whole ancestral connectivity, which is very strong throughout Indonesia but especially also here in La Malera, where it has a sea connection. And when they see sperm whales, they have to go out there and bring it back to the village, bring it back home, bring it back into the family.
you live here and you're born here and you see all this around you, you see all these special activities and all the way how the wheel is cut up according to rank and who does what on the boat, there's a phenomenal system in place here dealing with how whales are supposed to be treated. Not only killed, but also treated once they are killed. The modern world is fast catching up with La Malera. In the last two years, a road came through. And with it came TV and mobile phones, motorbikes, and unfortunately for the whales, outboard engines. I was walking along and I, I got waved over by three elders and I've known them for quite some years. And very quickly the conversation took a turn to what La Malera wants to be in the future. And it looks like they're getting very serious about turning back the clock in the sense that there's been a lot of change in this village. There's been motors and modernization and all the things I look for. And these guys actually want to change all that back and stay pure. There has been no whales for two months now, and there is concern amongst the whale hunters that if they don't protect their traditional ways, they will break the bond with their ancestors, and the whales will disappear. Do you feel you can still continue following your own traditional culture with these new things that are coming in? Yes, they said. Then I asked them, well, what about your religion? Because they've had a Christian pastor here who died not so long ago. Do you feel that you can hold on to your traditional practices and embrace the new? Yes, they said. And if we have no whales and we're not allowed to hunt whales here anymore, we will die. If they go back to their traditional ways of hunting the sea, it'll be very good for the Savo Sea ecosystem because it means that they will be doing things that they've been doing for hundreds of years and the productivity of the Savo Sea can most likely cope with it. Lamellarans taking six whales a year may be sustainable, but these leviathans stop for nothing and regularly collide with whales. Out in the wide open sea, the chances of a collision course between the ship and the whale, they're actually quite small. But when you get to a passageway where the ships are getting concentrated and the marine life is getting concentrated and the whales are getting concentrated, that's where your overlap and your chance of a direct hit increase significantly. So we're doing our whale survey in the migration corridors between Panta and Lembata. And it's also a shipping lane. It's a sea route. It's quite noisy where the propeller and the engines are, but it's relatively quiet at the bow. Sometimes whales misjudge the distance and they get hit. But it's not just ships that are a menace to whales. Endless rivers of rubbish also ride the currents of the Coral Triangle. So while we are tracking sperm whales in mean, this ocean wilderness, this is one of the most insidious ones. We call these the silent killers. It's a big current line full of plastic debris. It doesn't biodegrade or anything like that, so that's in the ocean for a long, long time. And it accumulates in these current lines where a lot of filter feeders do their foraging. And they ingest it, it blocks their stomach, and then they can't feed anymore and they'll die of starvation. With the increased wealth of the nation, comes more consumption and there's no waste management so everything eventually ends up in the sea and this junk it'll stay there the great currents of the coral triangle also bring plastics to the shore in the backwaters and bays One man's trash is another man's treasure. On their way home from the fish market, Valerie Taylor and her nephew Jono make a rich discovery. 
This could be really interesting. We have a strip of sort of plastic garbage like this at Ambon. Yeah. And it goes down and meets the ocean. And it's the best muck diving I've ever seen. Best critters, because they live, whoops, in all these bits and pieces whoops. that are hanging around. They Jeez, just don't step. don't step in anything awful. I think there might even be human feces around here. Oh, that was horrible. There's a lot of good muck critters. They live in places like that. And I think that if we get the chance, we should have a dive. A dive where? Out there. I can't imagine anything living out there, Valerie. There must be something. Valerie can't resist a dive with creatures that live in the muck. I love seeing a river of muck and having a dive in it. And it actually shows how adaptable marine animals can be, that they live in this muck. It's the floating muck that is so bad, and there's so much of it. The muck that I sort of enjoy most is sunken muck. It's not going anywhere. It's like a sunken ship. You know, a sunken ship becomes a reef. The adaptability of the small animals is very impressive. And many fish live in tins and bottles. And I don't think we should ever take a bottle out of the ocean and think that we are cleaning it up. Bottles are very important. They, they make great homes for a lot of creatures. And they're made of sand. So as they disintegrate, they just turn back into sand. Being right next to the fish markets. That helps. You see, it's just sand, and the junk on it gives them a home. It gives them a base, like a settlement plate or a, a house or something. As she discovered over many years of diving, it's not pretty, but it's not the strongest that survive, but the ones most responsive to change. Adaptation has made the Coral Triangle the most enduring tropical ecosystem in the world. Octopus are very clever the way they can make a home in almost anything. A broken glass, an old bottle under a spoon. They're one of the most fascinating of all the sea creatures. And they can work things out very quickly. The Seven Seas rides the currents through the Straits of Pantar. But a family going home in the opposite direction can't make any headway, even with the engine at full power. Mark realises the boat is dangerously close to the rocks. But I don't want to pull them along the ro rocks in case they spear off and crash into the rocks. So they've got to come out, away from the rocks, and then we'll take the rope. They don't understand. 
They managed to get the locals around the corner and on their way. <laughs> That's our good deed for the day. That's uh, what these people are up against, this current, man. It's just so strong. You can't get home. You miss the tide. More than 100 million people depend on the Coral Triangle for their survival. They know their currents well but still hundreds of lives are taken every year by the same force that feeds them. The reef is rich in coral, but Valerie's search for the schools of sharks she used to see has been in vain. But she's found another shark that comes to the coral triangle to feed in the currents. And it's the biggest shark of all, the whale shark. This filter feeding giant has found a fast food outlet. Bait fish in the nets of the tuna fishing station. And one fish's bait becomes another fish's banquet. The guys that live on the floating fish platforms are tuna fishermen, and they harvest great netfuls of anchovies and keep them alive to attract the tuna. But they attract the whale sharks as well. We had eight or nine sharks at the one time. You don't want to get in the middle of them because they're very hard and heavy and they couldn't care less about you. But I pulled the net around me and got right up to the mouth and was filming this fish going in. They were shoving each other around and playing around. They were doing things I've never thought a whale shark could do. They were having fun. But there's another giant island wanderer that harnesses the currents of the Coral Triangle to make ocean passages. With a combined coastline that could wrap around the world three times, the Coral Triangle Islands are ideal for crocodiles. Like the turtle, it still wears its heavy reptilian armor, but is known for lightning strikes on its prey. At the eastern end of our journey lies the island of Wetar, where the crocodile has a very special status. They are almost universally feared, but here they are treated as gods, because the people believe the crocodiles are their ancestors. The people of Wetar have always had a close relation with this animal. There are 
special crocodile clans here. They predominate amongst the few clans in Weta. The pure Wetterese consider their ancestors to be crocodiles. If they come across a dead crocodile, they will afford it all the pomp of a human funeral. And uh, there are on the islands here special crocodile callers who can go and actually call the crocodiles. Every day she is here, that is her nest piled up there. And apparently there will be eggs there in the nest. They don't know what he eats but obviously he manages to eat enough to sustain a, a really quite large crocodile. I feel a little sensitive about interviewing this lady because uh, apparently she lost her child to this crocodile on the river, which she lives right next to, last year. So if a crocodile does eat a human, they don't kill the crocodile, they hold a special ceremony to pacify the relationship between crocodiles and humans. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a little cave you can see just on the other side of the river. Several times a day he comes out down this river right next to these people, out into the sea, back in again over there. He even occasionally comes up on this side of the river, which presumably is how the child was lost just a year ago. Here's our crocodile caller. A few months ago, a fellow was killed here by a crocodile. A coconut fell out of the tree and landed in the water. And he went over to pick up the coconut. The crocodile got him. And it was after that that this gentleman had one of the rituals invoking the crocodile's presence and hopefully pacifying the relationship between humans and the crocodile. This is like their religion. It's in the story of their, their birth from the mother and father crocodile gods. All these people are united, however different they are in the Coral Triangle, they are united by the belief in an invisible world of being more real than the material world. So he's going to be coming up soon. It's enormous. Did you see that? One gets lulled into a sense of full security waiting here for an hour and a half. <laughs> ben is elated with his earlier encounter with the massive sperm whale. But the rare blue whale he hoped to see here has eluded him. So it comes as almost a last minute miracle when one of these rare giants crosses his path. We were heading back after all of that, and then in a very narrow corridor passage, there was a raging current, and there was a blue whale right in that current. A blue whale? There was a lot of current rushing through from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean, and we could follow it on the water. It was only three, four meters under the water all the time, so we could see it. So we placed the speedboat in the same speed, in the same course, and when it came up, it was maybe 15 meters away. Getting close to a blue whale is always a challenge. It is a very difficult animal to get close to.
The blue whale is the largest animal ever to have lived on our planet. Yet it eats tiny krill. Which is on the surface and looping around very close to shore. Wow. And I've never seen anything like that in 10 meters at times, where the local kids were screaming and yahooing from excitement. And spouts and big blows, wow. uh, but very close to shore. So we were all actually very excited and yahooing. This will is really well behaved. I mean, it's doing the same thing. And it came up really close to the boat. He's doing this loop again. He's right in front of us. But it's the second time he's done this loop. Initially, I thought it, it might have been an error because there was so much current that I thought that animal went broadside and then got, got, got swung over by the push of the water. But right. it did that at least four times. It did that. Getting close to a blue whale is always a challenge. It is a very difficult animal to get close to because they only come up for 30 seconds, one or two blows, and they're down again for 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. And in those 20 minutes, the animal changes course on the water and you're still going that particular direction, which it has been doing for the last hour or two. You'll be surprised how quickly you can lose a 30 meter whale. It can just vanish like that. We collected a lot of really interesting data. Going out wide into the Savu Sea and encountering two male sperm whales in close proximity to one another. That is another really interesting observation because males are supposed to have some kind of standoff before they migrate up. We photographed both of them, we identified both of them, so I'm quite glad to have those on file. We haven't seen any large-scale fishing boats, we haven't seen any long liners, we haven't seen any drift nets, we haven't seen much gill netting. So this area is still very much a, a wild and wonderful piece of the ocean. There's a big storm brewing and there's a front coming through as well, so it's getting late and we still have a ways to go, so I'll have to break off. I'm going to say goodbye to the whales and hopefully continue on tomorrow. Let's get out of here. The ocean highways of the Coral Triangle are still open and the six nations of the Coral Triangle Initiative are working together to save this unique world heritage area. But the pressure of pollution, climate change and an Asian economic boom is fast encroaching. Next episode, we focus on the people who live in this paradise and see what is being done to find solutions for the future. <laughs>